So I just finished watching Alex Becker's video titled A Deep Analysis of Why Ethereum is Terrible. And I want to make this response video, you know, as a blockchain developer who works the Ethereum protocol on a daily basis to give you some of my thoughts on this and also offer some counterpoints. So, you know, full disclosure, I like Alex. He and I have been talking about crypto back and forth. You know, he gave me a shout out on his video and I want to make this video have a respectful tone. But I want to actually take out, you know, some of the arguments from his video, as many as I can gather from just like watching the video one time, you know, maybe 85% of it on 2x speed and take a couple of these arguments and kind of dissect them a little bit because I'm sure lots of other people have these same types of questions. At the end of the day, you know, I want to encourage better dialogue. So, you know, full disclosure on where I'm coming from. If you're new around here, or maybe you're coming over from Alex's channel. I'm a blockchain developer. I work with Ethereum pretty much every day. I do hold Ethereum. It's the largest one in my portfolio. And so that's where I'm coming from out of full transparency. But you can think about it like this. You know, I made a massive bet on this tech, you know, narrowing down on this is my core field of expertise. You know, time is my only non-renewable resource. And I've invested a lot of time into learning this. Okay. But at the end of the day, you know, if ETH doesn't work out, then I can specialize in something else a lot faster than a ranked beginner could, you know, end of story. So, but if you are brand new around here, I'll give you the official channel intro. You know, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to become a blockchain master step-by-step from start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. And last but not least, I hate that I have to give these disclaimers, but this is not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not telling you to buy or sell Ethereum based on any of this information. And there are tons of people impersonating me down in the comment section below. Just don't even acknowledge them. They're scammers. I'll never ask you for your phone number, give you my phone number, or ask you to invest with me. All right, so before I talk about the you know counterpoints, I want to just make sure that I clearly articulate the argument here, where he's coming from, that I'm doing it justice, okay? So he's talking about this a lot from like an investor's perspective of buying and holding Ether for a period of like, you know, three to five years. He's basically saying that, you know, he used to hold a lot of Ether and now he holds a lot less. He's not saying like Ethereum, he, he doesn't believe in it at all over the long term. But what he's saying is like over this period of, you know, three to five years, he thinks that, you know, the bull market that we're right in right now will pop. And that sometime during this bear market right here, you know, Ethereum is in a really vulnerable spot for, you know, a competitor to come in and basically eat his lunch. And he doesn't want to hold ETH throughout this time period because uh, it's too risky. And he doesn't want to hold as much ETH as he did before because it's too risky for this, uh, you know, spot right here. And so it makes a lot of solid points. All right. But here, here's the whole thing. All right. I, I'm not going to claim to know what's going to happen to the ETH price in three to five years, you know, which cryptocurrency is going to be more valuable, all that kind of stuff. But the entire crux of his argument from an investor standpoint is based upon technical fundamentals of the Ethereum network and also its competitors out there. Okay. So that's what I really want to focus on is basically the technical fundamentals of, of ETH, what's actually realistically going to happen within the next three to five years. And also like really soon after, you know, today, like maybe even weeks from watching this video. Okay. So from a technical standpoint, the first thing that really jumped out to me in the video is that he doesn't even mention layer two scaling like at all he talks you know some about eth2 and eip 1559 and how people you know arguably put way too much trust in these things that they're going to fix you know eth gas problems but his whole argument is that like you know eth2 is way too far away it's not going to ship until we enter that bear market phase and that there's no guarantee that eip 1559 is going to get shipped even in july that it's not going to fix the gas fees and that even is way too far off so i mean I won't get into these things like too much, although there's a huge incentive for EIP 1559 to actually ship in July because of the difficulty bomb that's going to go off after that. And yes, actually EIP 1559 will do a lot to improve these gas fees. But the bigger thing is like he doesn't even mention layer two. So I don't even know if he's aware that layer two scaling solutions are coming out like really soon, like this month in March. So layer two scaling is basically building a second layer on top of Ethereum, where a lot of the activity can happen and reduce some of the load off the main Ethereum chain. So this is greatly going to reduce ETH gas fees and also make it a lot faster than it is right now. And this solution is literally right around the corner. So I'm looking at Optimism right here, which is one implementation of optimistic rollups. So Optimism is launching in March. And you can see the demos they did with Synthetic Exchange, which reduced gas costs by 143 times. And also the Unipig exchange, which is basically a testnet implementation of Uniswap, where it released, reduced the gas cost by 10 to 100x. And you also see a massive endorsement of this by Hayden Adams, the creative Uniswap, saying, imagine not needing to make any changes to your Solidity smart contract to have a dApp work natively on Ethereum L2 with security from Ethereum. Massive scaling, no data availability issues, and synchronous interoperability between other dApps. So this is literally about to go live. And some of these points might be completely null and void after this ships. Now, I also want to be fully transparent. Like, layer 2 scaling is not going to be the end-all, be-all. Like, complete checkmate move or anything like that. But the problem is going to get way better. 
And it'll totally push back on the idea that like Ethereum is not doing anything about fixing this problem and that the only realistic solutions are just way too far out in the future. Like that's not even close to true. And yes, there are still many months for EIP 1559 ships, but this is about to happen like soon. So the next thing about the video is I think it kind of underestimates the technical feat of actually creating a decentralized blockchain that's scalable, you know, decentralized that can support, you know, apps and that people will actually use. You know, one of the reasons I focus on Ethereum on this channel is because it's the most credibly neutral public blockchain where you can actually build apps today that has users. And it's insanely hard to get to that point, even for Ethereum with all of its sort of warts and wrinkles that it has today. And I think a lot of people underestimate how insanely hard this is. You know, people talk about, you know, you know the whole MySpace versus Facebook argument or like the network effects of Internet Explorer versus Netscape. And, you know, Alex talks about some of those in his video. He also talks about like click funnels and how all these other competitors come in and like, you know, totally steal its market share. And I get these analogies, like like they're they're good analogies to a certain point. A lot of people use them, but they fail to actually grasp the depth of what's going on here. OK, so like building a competitive software company is not even close to like building a competitive blockchain that actually works simply because of the fact that nobody's actually created this fast, scalable blockchain ever yet. It's like way more like rocket science, maybe even harder than rocket science, before we ever had a rocket that went to outer space and landed on the moon. Like that's where we are with the history of blockchain technology right now. And so that kind of undermines a little bit of what he's saying about, uh, you know, building something from the ground up that can compete with like what Ethereum has right now and how, you know, there's just a huge opportunity for somebody to come and do that. He talks about like, you know, a software system that's sort of like, has all these problems heaped on top of one another and it creates this kind of spaghetti type thing. I can't remember the exact analogy he used in this video, but I know where he's coming from this. Like he's talking about having seen this problem inside of running SaaS companies in the past where you have technical debt. And sometimes the easier thing to do when you have technical debt or, or better thing to do in the long term is just build something brand new from scratch uh, than try to fix this thing right here, that this is actually going to yield the better long term result. And this is why ETH is such a huge risk. But the problem with that is like building a software product is kind of a solved problem. If you can build a web application that basically just manages users, sends out emails, takes in data from different APIs, implements the business logic, there are bazillions of people on the face of the planet who can help you do that type of thing. Because we've built so many similar things that work, you know, almost the same. But that's not really true for blockchain. Like we still haven't implemented the thing that could come in and actually be a viable competitor. You know, Alex talks about click funnels and how like these other people came in and, and started poaching market share for them. But the reality is like I could go on a 72 hour binge coding session and build a really crude competitor to click funnels. Or, you know, if you just handed me $20 million, I could go create a viable SaaS product in so many different niches that could steal some market share from competitors. Why? Because there's lots of developers out there. There's product managers, designers, copywriters, marketers run paid traffic. And as long as I hire the right people, which there are lots of people out there who have all those skills, I could spend that $20 million and create a competitive SaaS. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be the winner, right? It matters like who's steering that ship and who has the experience with that company. But the whole part is like we've built plenty of SaaSes before. We have not even built a single fast, scalable public blockchain that gets the best trade off of the scaling trilemma that has millions of users yet. And you can't just throw money at this problem like you could a SaaS. So history has shown us that we can throw a ton of money at this problem and we can't just magically solve it because these are literally the problems that like keep super geniuses awake at night, scratching their head, trying to figure out how do we implement this thing in concrete detail and actually pull it off. So another thing about the video is that I think it really underestimates Ethereum's network effect. Okay, because I mean, this is one of the arguments Ethereum has going for it, that it has such a rich ecosystem of apps and users. That's one of the things that gives the most value, okay? So you can look at network effect like Metcast law, okay? So basically that's saying the value of a telecommunications network is pro proportional to the square of the number of uh, connected users to the system, okay? So like on a phone network, if there's two phones, there's one connection. If there's five phones, there's 25 connections, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, you know, for every new user, so these are, you know, users right here, and this is value right here. For every new user, it's basically an exponential amount of value. So this is also true for Ethereum's users, but uh, you have to think about why the users are there in the first place. It's not just to, like hold Ether, you know, send money around. It's also to use dApps. So similarly, like the more dApps we have, the crazier this problem gets. So essentially, you know, there's a linear input here that, you know, yields an exponential output and value. But the whole 
you know, important thing is like the X axis, which is attracting the user. So you have to attract the users to get here, which essentially gets exponentially harder, the more value there is on a competitive network. And sure, we've seen lots of other projects fail, uh, especially in the early days of the internet, there are things that had network effect that really aren't used to the same degree today. People talk about MySpace, Facebook, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Different early dot com companies that have plenty of network effect that died off. But again, the big thing that is underestimated here is the amount of effort required to create something where users are actually attracted to the system. So what do you need? Well, you need a fast, scalable, decentralized blockchain. You know, we've already talked about how insanely hard just this problem alone is. But on top of that, you need developer tools. We're talking like programming languages used to write the code, ways to compile and run that code on the blockchain itself, tools that let you just do all this kind of stuff. You need actually developers. So there's a huge barrier of entry to learning those programming languages that are required to put these new smart contracts on these blockchains or to create any of their programmability for these blockchains. And then once you have that, you also need apps, right? The developers create, and then those apps also have to have liquidity. So you have to have other users actually come in with real money and put them in these apps, okay? And they have a really compelling alternative to go to somewhere else that has all these things already. And so do developers, right? They have a compelling alternative to go where there's already demand and they still have to go through the huge like learning curve of learning how to do this stuff. And don't forget, like we have to go figure out what actually works in these ecosystems. We spent years trying to figure out how to get smart contracts right for Ethereum, what to do with them, the best practices. And all those learnings aren't just going to instantly transfer over to an other system that works completely differently, okay? So for this reason, it's a way different problem than just like trying to build the next MySpace or Facebook where we have programming languages that have already built very similar type of things in the past. We have developers that know how to do it. It's just about trying to think about the competitive product, how to implement it, and then the rest of the problems behind the scenes are more or less solved as long as you hire the right smart people to do it. It's just not even the same thing with blockchain right now. So another thing he talks about in the video is he really critiques Ethereum's leadership. And he talks about how these other platforms have just way better, stronger leaders. Okay. Uh, so part of Ethereum's leadership is like a feature, not a bug, especially in terms of decentralization. I know he's like talking about two different things, how like, you know, Ethereum community props up Vitalik and he just thinks Vitalik doesn't look like a very confident leader, all that stuff. I get where he's coming from that. Um, part of me, I think about it this way. This is actually an interview uh, where they, they got to talk to Vitalik's dad here. And he says, he's not too excited that the community assigns so much importance to him. He wants the community to be more resilient. He's trying to focus time on research. So I take this as Vitalik is like trying to become an important contribution to Ethereum rather than like the person who's leading the charge. And this is a feature, not a bug because Ethereum is supposed to be decentralized. And if you have like a single leader, it's a point of centralization, which can actually pose some serious problems. So you want a decentralized ecosystem to be anti-fragile to where if one part of it breaks, like the whole system doesn't crumble apart. And that's the whole ethos of Ethereum is to create a decentralized community that can actually be incentivized with common goals to achieve this result that's not just centrally controlled. Because think about it, you, you can basically fix almost any problem in a blockchain just by centralizing, introducing a central point of control. But it always introduces massive problems. Like, of course, you know, power, but also think about it being a huge failure point. I know we've seen lots of really successful companies, you know, with strong leaders, with really charismatic founders become really successful. But you have to think about blockchain differently from just a company. If you run a blockchain like a company and you just like put this leader at the front of it and you're placing all your bets on that leader, like what do you think is going to happen to that cryptocurrency if that person dies? I mean, I think all the blockchain projects at this point have some sort of, you know, founding leader that everybody looks to for guidance. But I think Vitalik is purposely trying to sort of remove himself from that equation. And, and this is one of the reasons. I'm not saying he's worried about dying or anything like that. But the whole point is to like make Ethereum a decentralized ecosystem where he doesn't just like, you know, run the show. And I know lots of people will say, well, hey, that's like, you know, bad for business. We want like these strong leaders at the helm, just like calling the shots, cracking the whip and like, you know, pushing things out there and hyping things up with marketing, all that kind of stuff. But there is a trade off with this decentralization. And it's a good thing, which is it is slower to make changes. You want a blockchain to be slower to make changes. But we're also seeing Ethereum's leadership actually play out, especially with the layer two scaling solutions that I've been talking about, which are coming, you know, they're basically here. The incentives have to be in place for people to coordinate together to solve this problem, and they're doing it. And I think we're about to see massive breakthroughs with this. Despite having like top-down control that just says like, hey, do this, and like pulls some levers and makes it happen. So point number five is ultimately the conclusion that Alex makes in his video, which is basically he reduced his ETH position because he doesn't want to ride out this bear market right here. And he's worried that someone could come in and be a competitor and eat ETH launch right here. So number one, like 
I realize nobody wants to hold through this bear market regardless of what happens. There's tons of risk with crypto. And I'm 100% open about that on this channel. And as always, it's not financial advice. But the really interesting thing about his argument is that for all the like technical problems that he talks about with ETH, that he now has more faith in its competitors who really haven't delivered on all their long-term promises. Of course, we've seen Binance Smart Chain, which is just a fork of Ethereum. It's way more centralized. It does a lot of technical trade-offs to make you know the chain itself faster, lower the fees. But for some of his other big bets, it's crazy to me like how he's more confident in those things who haven't really even shipped their full products yet, don't have users like Ethereum is today. I mean, I could see, you know, having doubts about Ethereum based on the technical problems that it has right now. And there's no guarantee that it's going to fix its problems down the road. Totally get that 100%. But to then say my next logical conclusion is I'm going to put a bigger bet on something that hasn't even gotten to the point where Ethereum is yet to have these types of problems. Because we've seen so many times throughout crypto, like people come in and make all these promises and never deliver on those promises. People buy into the hype and the narratives and get absolutely wrecked. Yeah, I've been in this space for a long time watching these problems and it's happened so many times. I'm not saying someone can never come in and eat eat lunch like he's talking about right here, but it's crazy to me though that the conclusion that you would then make from that is to place a bigger bet on somebody who hasn't even come close to eating Ethereum's lunch yet. Is only just talking about how they're going to do it and haven't, you know, had any real proof that it's possible. All right, so that's all I've got. So again, like this is not financial advice. I'm not telling you whether to buy or sell Ethereum based on any of this information. I just want to make this video in response to Alex. Again, I like Alex. He and I have been talking about crypto back and forth. He's a super smart guy. He's got a lot of good ideas. But I just want to make this video with some counterpoints because I'm sure lots of people have these same types of objections. So that's all I've got. You know, as always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. It really helps these videos out. Someone who can learn about blockchain. You like these videos? and you're as fast as the technology as I am, how can you get your hands dirty today? You go to my YouTube homepage, you can buy any of my free courses there, like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those videos, you went to the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can try to become a blockchain master step-by-step from start to finish over at daffyuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. Don't worry, you don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding background become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months, all right? So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.